well, I just love this church. Yes, like I really, I feel like, and when you said family, that's what I feel like. Like I'm seeing all these people that I know and like giving hugs and uh, it's just really, you guys are just awesome. So I just love y'all. So I feel like I'm like the uncle that comes to the barbecue, barbecue, uh, to just eat the barbecue. <laughs> no, I'm I've only eaten barbecue twice this week. I've been a good boy. Amen. Uh, so I don't know. Anyway, praise God. It's good to be here. Amen. Good to be here with you guys tonight. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah, we've had a really, really good, um, it's been an awesome time of uh, ministry and just connecting, and, and uh, you guys got a lot of good stuff happening in this area. And uh, man, went, <clears throat> went to Love Lady this morning, oh my gosh. Honestly, one of the greatest ministry experiences in my entire life. Completely overwhelmed. Completely. And when Mark told me about it, he had a little twinkle in his eye. I caught that twinkle. He's like, oh, you'll see, you'll see. And I just kind of like, what was that? And then someone else had done the same. Leslie had done the head a little twinkle, too. And I thought, I'm getting into something that I'm not real sure what's going to happen. Well, so I go <clears throat> at 7 a.m. to do the devotional, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, this is going to be really low key. And, you know, it's 7 a.m., you know, and uh, and to do this devotional. And, man, I walk in there and there's like there's 400 women worshiping Jesus. Yeah. Like I'm talking like. I was just like, and they're like everywhere. Like, you know, I don't know if anybody's been out there, but like, I would encourage you to go. Go out there and minister. It will, it is, it will bless you. And uh, they got uh, like three, three levels of people. Like people just ever, it was overwhelming. And I went up on the platform and they're all worshiping. And I'm like super, I'm a little uncomfortable because like, I like to, I don't, because I, I mean like here I am. And here they are, and they're worshiping their hearts out. And I just feel like, kind of like, like, I don't know. And I, the, the beauty of that moment, to see them uh, just worshiping the Lord out of a place of beauty and humility and, and just abandon and no self-righteousness and no religion. And these, these girls got rescued from crazy stuff. I could not stop crying. Like, I was just overwhelmed by the beauty of the body of Christ. And uh I cried so hard that I got I got a little concerned because I thought I thought I'm about to ugly cry. I need to I need to get myself together. I'm about to get snotty up in here, you know. And and I'm looking around and there's like no tissue anywhere. And I'm like, you know, I, I like I'm thinking to myself, Jeremiah, you gotta get yourself together. You about to speak, brother, you know. And I'm up there. I'm like biting my lip. And my lips quivering and stuff. And it was just like. It was really unusual experience, but but it was just awesome, and they were just so hungry for Jesus, and uh, just beautiful to see what they're doing, and that's something happening in your city, amen. Just the blessings on Birmingham, man, it's just wonderful. So, amen, it's awesome. But we have tonight, amen. And uh, Jesus is here, and uh, He loves you, and uh, He's got a word for you, amen. Let's. I'm going to pray, Father. I just thank you for these wonderful people. And, uh, Lord, I'm just really honored to be here with them. I thank you that I am just, uh, we're family, Lord, and uh, we're part of the body of Christ, and, and we're part of each other. And, Lord, it's just a joy to see distant family and be able to share in a time of fellowship. Lord, that's so wonderful, and we thank you for that. And, Lord, I just, I thank you that, uh, Lord, you help me to love them the way you love them, Lord. Give me, give me your heart. Let me care about them when I'm speaking, Lord. Let me really see them the way you see them. Lord, and I thank you, Spirit of God. You are the teacher that you speak into their lives, Lord God. And, and Lord, you reveal a facet of yourself to all of us tonight that maybe we've never seen before. Show us Jesus, Lord. We want to see Jesus in the scriptures. We want to see Jesus <clears throat> in each other. And Lord, we just, we thank you for that. We thank you for the work that you're going to do in our lives tonight. We thank you for this time that you just fill it full of yourself in Jesus' name. Amen. And um, so, how many know that, that um, when, when truth comes, change is going to happen? When, when truth comes... Because how many know that, that truth is stronger and greater than our opinions? 
<clears throat> like if I'm, sorry, I keep trying to clear my throat, but if I run over there to that wall and I run as hard as I can into that wall, um, <laughs> which I'm not, praise God, but if I did, how many know that, that I'm not greater than the wall, the wall's greater than me, and if I, and if I run into that wall, then the wall is not going to move, but I'm going to move. That's deep, isn't it? All right, we're good. We're done. Praise God. I hope y'all enjoyed that. Amen. Be blessed in the Lord. No. Um, But when you make contact with truth, truth isn't going to change. We are. But we have a choice on whether we embrace truth or not. But when truth is embraced, change happens. Now, the thing about being a human being is uh, we don't really like change. We like to feel safe. We like to feel comfortable. We like to know what to expect um, because we live in a world that's filled with challenges. And, And how many know the vast majority of what we do not the vast, but a portion of what we do is to endeavor to make ourselves, make it as easy as we can. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, you know, like if, like I, and, and see, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. How many know that wisdom will provide a better way? That's, that's one of the, the, the beauties of, of gathering knowledge over the, you know, the past hundreds of years or whatever is hopefully we get better at some stuff and there's some things that we don't get as good at too, but, um, we like easy. And so, and, and because this world is, is a challenge, we endeavor to keep life easy. I mean, you know, ain't nobody in here believing God to have to change your tire when you leave church tonight, right? <laughs> Amen. And we ain't prophesying that on nobody. Amen. We are going to get home with no flat tires, but because we don't want, we don't want the discomfort. We don't want the, uh, we don't want to have to deal with it, right? Because I mean, you know, life is difficult enough, and so, and so because of, of, of that, of, the, of those things, when change comes, when truth comes, and then in order for me to embrace that truth, no, if I embrace that truth, then change is going to come in me. And so what can happen is we get real comfortable where we're at, and we don't, we don't want to change. But God knows in order for you to go where you're going, where he has for you, that change is necessary. How many know that the children of Israel, they wanted the promised land, but they didn't, they didn't necessarily want the mindset that they needed in order to occupy it. Like, I see that blessing over there. I want that. But uh, the, the things that I have to embrace in order to get that, I don't necessarily want that. And so, and then here we are, and, you know, how many of y'all believe in God for some big stuff? You know? And, like, if you just believe a portion of this book, it's big stuff. Amen? And so, like, there's all kinds of blessing that the Lord has for you and me, and we want it, Right? We want, the, we want what he has. We want what he paid for. And so here we are. We want this stuff, and we want the blessing. But God's like, well, in order for you to get where you're going, there's going to be some truth that's going to have to come to you to bring change into your life so that you can walk through that door. Amen. And, and so, like, we see the promised land, we want that, but we don't want to change. And then when change comes, we kind of, we kick back a little bit. And, but God, how I many you know he's a good father, and he's a loving father, and a part of being a loving father um, is he's going to lead you, and he's going to guide you. Now, he will never force truth on you. It's just not how he does things. <clears throat> He'll invite you. But if you don't want it, you don't have to go. I mean, you know, there are people who will live and die on earth, 
and never, ever understand that Jehovah is a healer. <clears throat> and when they get to heaven, they're going to enjoy heaven just as much as we do. And we're not going to be more righteous than them. And we're not going to be, we're going to be same, you know. But there was an aspect of God's nature that they never got to experience in this life. And he's not going to force that on them because he loves them. But he will invite. He will invite. And so he's not going to force, but he'll invite. And so when, when, when truth comes, we have a decision to make, whether we're going to embrace it and allow it to change us or we're going to stay the same. Now, and, 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 and either way is okay. You, you follow me? Like, there's no pressure. God's, uh, I think God's a whole lot cooler than what we realize. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's a lot more laid back, I think, than what we realize. Like, he's already won the war. Can I get an amen? I mean, the game's basically over. We're in the victory lap. He's like, hey, I'm going to enjoy this life with you. I'm going to give you an opportunity to love people and help people and walk with people, and you can labor together with me. But at the end of the day, I win. <laughs> and you're with me, so you win too. And so, and so it's kind of like, you know, there's an element of God of, well, what do you want? You know, and we don't always like that, or at least I haven't, you know, um, because, because, you know, because like, I don't know what's best for me. You follow me? But he does, but he wants me and you to want and to ask and to walk with him in a place of relationship. Because if you don't ask, you don't have, and if you don't ask, you don't have the joy of being answered. He said, I want to bless you. So believe me. Let's go. Let's do big stuff. Let's do, let's, let's, let's go together, you know? And how I many know not everybody wants that? Um, and that's okay. But how I many know God wants to flex on your behalf? He wants to conquer on your behalf. He wants to be strong on your behalf. And I can remember a time where the Lord really kind of cornered me on something. And um, I was uh, down in Houston, and I was, I was in a conference, and the God really laid on my heart to write out a list of what I wanted from him. Now, and you have to understand, I came from, my background is we were all about blessing and not hardly at all about relationship. <clears throat> And uh, we we're blessing, 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 you know, and, and we treated God like a jukebox or like a, like a, you know, a, a slot machine. Thank you. And, and so um, when he asked me that, I'm like, God, I, you know, I'm cool with just you, you know, I just want you, Lord, you know. And, and so then I kind of, I kind of push back a little bit, you know, because sometimes you think, is this me or is this God? You know, I think we all deal with that at some point. And, and it was kept, and then finally, like, he woke me up in the middle of the night in the hotel room. And was like, and you know, I'm not talking about like an audible voice or anything. I'm just talking about like just pressing. I don't even know how to explain it. Y'all know what I'm trying to say. Write that list. <laughs> so it was like 2 o'clock in the morning. And I got this little hotel uh, paper. What is that stuff called? It doesn't really matter. Thank you. Stationary. Thank you. <clears throat> and like I got this pen. I'm laying in my bed like. You know, my penmanship's already bad. I already, you know, I already write in kindergarten font, font anyway. Did I say font? <laughs> Shoo! Farther, farther south you go, the worse the vernacular gets, man. My, my grammar just starts twisting and start making up words. But amazingly enough, y'all understand what I'm saying, you know? That's right. That's right. We'll get that kindergarten font. Hallelujah. That's the title of the sermon, you know, kindergarten fart. How do you spell that? I don't know. That's hilarious. Um, my penmanship is already bad, and so I'm laid up in the bed, 2 o'clock in the morning, writing this stuff out, and, and I put it in my wallet, and it's been in my wallet for like eight years. And here, and I haven't pulled it out or looked at it or anything. And I pulled it out and looked at it just a couple weeks ago. Unction of the Lord. And I sit down and I looked at all the things that he had checked off that list. Now, everything's not off that list. But I'm going to tell you something right now. Before I move on or before he comes back, 
Every single one of those is going to be checked off. I just know it is. Because, I mean, cause, cause, um, because he loves to bless his kids. Amen? And so <clears throat> it's important that we live our lives in a place of relationship and that we dream big, you know, and that we move forward and that we ask God for big things because, you know, when, I, when we get to heaven and we're sharing testimonies with all the other saints, you know, I mean, I want something to say at the table. I'd be sitting next to Moses like, what did God do for you? Uh, I'm not trying to make it all weird and pressury, but like, you know what I'm saying? I mean, like, it's, we, we're going to be up there. We're going to be talking. Moses is like, yeah, he split the Red Sea for me. And da, da, da. I was like, yeah, Moses, I know I read it, you know. But, and, and, uh, but like God wants us to believe him for big things so that he can show you how much he loves you and he's going to bless you, period. But what can happen to us, because we have believed for something, it didn't happen. And it can become painful. The Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. And so then what can happen is we lull ourselves into a false safety of no expectancy. If I expect nothing, I will never be disappointed. So hopelessness becomes a blanket that I wear to keep me from having my heart hurt. And we can fall asleep in that hopeless blanket. And how many know it's in that place where oppression and depression will try to ravage the mind and heart of a child of God? Where there is no vision, the people perish. You have got, we have got to have a hope for the future. Because if you don't have hope, you have nothing to look forward to. And you have no reason to get up, and you have no reason to live. See, there, there are people that struggle with depression, and the reason that the depression is there is because there are dead dreams in their heart. And secretly, inwardly, they bitterly feel as though God failed them. And if anyone has walked with the Lord for any period of time, you've probably experienced that. You know? I mean, old King David did. I mean, you see some of his psalms? He's mad. <laughs> Brother Dave's mad. He's running his mouth. Ain't he going to sing about it? Like, I wonder, is there just a little death metal in heaven that we're not aware of? You know, like, da 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 God, why have you forsaken me? da 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 You know, I like he says some stuff that I just can't see somebody singing in an angelic voice. Oh Lord. You know, I, I can't even make fun of it. I mean, I'm trying, but I can't. Yeah, like, but like if you look at some of the Psalms, Dave's mad and he's having a bad day and he, he's giving me he's mad at God. And he's running his mouth and he recorded a song about it, which I think is amazing. <clears throat> and then he'll end it and be like, but praise you the Lord. Selah. <laughs> I could just imagine his wife. She's like, David's over here writing that death metal again. I tell you what, <laughs> he's upset at the Lord. <laughs> but what I love about David is, I mean, you know, he had a he had a real relationship with God. If you're gonna have a real real relationship with God, you are not gonna put on a mask and echo someone else's prayer and someone else's voice in always uh, a major key. There's a minor key, and the minor key are the low points of distrust and heartache and pain and why. But the beauty of a song cannot be revealed on just major notes. It's the major and the minors, isn't it? It's the crescendo. It's the, you, know, you follow me? 
And so none of us crave these moments, but all of us need to open up our hearts and express to God how you feel. Because if you, because it's he see it's there whether you express it or not. I have had moments where <clears throat> I yelled at the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Like really mad, yelled at the Lord. Just being honest. I mean, he can handle it. He got it. And uh, and I think that. I mean, you know, a, a real relationship is going to have honesty. And honesty is more than happiness in good days. Amen. And so there's this place of realness with the Lord. And, and um, it's a healthy place and it's a good place. But it's important to express that. It's important, it's important to release that. Okay, and, and I'll just tell you, you know, when I was yelling at God, it's because I wanted another kid, to be completely honest with you. I mean, like, I'm like, I love kids. I want another kid. Why can't I have another kid? You know, and, and I, you know, I felt like Abraham, you know, like Abraham didn't believe. Now, I didn't find a Hagar. Can I get an amen? Because <laughs> I'm free, but I ain't that free. And we in the new covenant, and you get one wife, because that's all you can handle. Amen. Hallelujah. But I did get mad. And, and, but how many know that eventually my, the promise came and he, he fulfilled that, but I had periods of time where I was in pain and bitter and really in unbelief and really and truly the promise really didn't come to pass until I gave up. You know, like gave up on me and my, and what I could do and any of that and said, man, you know, praise God. You know, and but when the promise did come, it was so sweet and I was so thankful. But but what I want to show you is that in every walk in with the Lord, there's going to be times of disappointment. Okay, ain't nobody excited about that. But we have to be honest, you know, because like if you got everything you prayed for as soon as you got it, as soon as you prayed it, and every promise immediately. I mean, you know, that first of all, we'd probably be spoiled brats. I mean, you know, a ch- if you give a child everything they want as soon as they want it, you're setting them up for failure. Because life will not deliver that to them. And when life doesn't deliver that to them, they feel entitled, and then they feel offended, and then they blame everybody but themselves. It is true. I mean, you know, a part of raise- raising a tot, you know, Toddlers have no concept of time. Like, we're, we're learning this in the Johnson house. We're doing this again. You know what I'm saying? I got the blessing of Abraham. Hallelujah. I got a two-year-old. He's not even two, but, like, there are certain words you can't say around him because you cannot say pizza around him because if you say the pizza around him, he thinks he's getting pizza right now. Like, pizza, pizza, and he'll just throw himself on the ground and just, like, like totally just lose it, man, you know? And, you know, you can't say, you got to spell it. You can't say ice cream around him. Same response. I don't know where he gets that from. You know what I'm saying? It must be in the genetics somewhere. Hallelujah. <laughs> well said. Yeah. We'll, we'll camp on that, right? But, um... He has to be taught that the world doesn't revolve around him. And there's an element of maturity and development of character waiting for the promise that you get no other way. You can't get that in Bible school. You can't get that. I'll, I'll take a step further and say you can't even really get that just through studying Scripture. There's a, there's a walk with the Lord where you learn patience and trust. Like my, my 14-year-old, he's in a different place of relationship with us because, you know, he's older. He knows if I tell him we're going to go get ice cream, he knows we're going to do it. So he doesn't throw a fit wanting it immediately. He knows it's going to happen because he trusts me. And so the passage of time doesn't bother him 
because he knows I'm going to deliver because he knows me. My toddler is learning who I am, really. And so he's learning how to trust. He's learning how to allow the passive time. Said all that to say this, God doesn't give you everything as soon as you ask for it. And then you also have to take consideration, some people are praying for rain. Some people are not praying for rain. Some people are praying for Alabama football. Some people are praying for Auburn football. Bad joke. Why did you even say that? Lord's like, I was trying to keep you anointed, but then you went there and nobody even thinks that's funny anymore. I'm sorry. I'll move, move right along. But, I mean, oh, there's, there's a lot of factors going into everybody's prayer. And we, a part of us growing up and trusting the Lord is allowing the passage of time and, and also handling things that we don't understand. And, I, and, I, and, I'll, tell you, and I'll say something else. There's some things that we're not going to understand in this life. Seriously. I believe that. I believe there are some things that you're not going to understand until you get to the other side. But when you get there, I believe that you're going to find out that the Lord was way better than what you thought. I really do. I really do. Just like, you know, and I read this example out because helps, I think it helps us understand, but I can't convey to my two-year-old why ice cream's not in his mouth right now. Someone say ice cream, and, the, and the, like my 14-year-old say ice cream, will be like, oh, gosh, why did you do that? And then it, ah, I can't convey to him. We don't have ice cream in the house. We have to go to the store. He can't comprehend store. How many know there are things that the Lord cannot convey to our understanding in this life? Amen. And so there's a place of trusting him in the midst of this. How many of the disciples didn't understand why Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat? Like, what in the world is wrong with the Lord? Where are you at, brother? You know, you're asleep. Like, you know, like we dying out here. And he was asleep in the back of the boat, and they didn't understand. And how many know their response was to accuse him of not caring? And his response was, don't you trust me? Oh, ye of little trust. See, sometimes I think when we we hear the word faith, we we always think about a dynamic like an equation rather than a relationship. Faith is just, it's trust. It's like, I trust that you're going to take care of me and you're going to, you know, you're going to do what you're going to do, you know? And so we have to be careful to not get offended at the Lord when things don't go our way. Amen. And we also have to be careful not to allow the enemy to condemn us when that happens. Because that's what he does. He, gonna come, he comes after us, man, and tries to get us and say, well, the reason that's not happening is because there's something wrong with you. Or you didn't do this, or you did do this, or whatever. And how I many of the promises of God are not contingent upon you? They're contingent upon Jesus. Amen. And so there, there are these hurt places that need truth. But we don't want to be touched with truth in the places where we've been hurt. Because sometimes truth hurts in the place, in that place. You ready to get a splinter out? You know, as an adult, you understand you get a splinter, you got to get out. I mean, there ain't nothing fun about getting a splinter out. It's going to hurt. And, um, but it's for your good. And so there are places, there are splinters of disappointment that can be in our hearts and in our minds, and the Lord wants to bring truth, and he wants to remove that splinter. But in order for him to do that, we have to allow him into that place. Because once again, he's not going to force. Deliverance is never forced on the believer. Um, you can't cast a demon out of someone who's not saved. So that's the difference, you know. But truth 
comes for the purpose of freedom and healing, okay? But a lot of times what happens is we want to compartmentalize the Lord. Okay, God, I'm totally cool with you healing me. I'm cool with you blessing me financially. I am not cool with you telling me how to run my marriage. <laughs> or I'm cool with this and that, but don't tell me how to raise my kids. Or, or whatever. You follow me? And then we want to kind of compartmentalize them and say, we're cool with this, but don't mess with this. I'm, and what we're, and what we re, whether we realize or not, what we're saying is, I'm God of this area. You're dismissed from this. And because he's a good father and he's a loving father, he does not take all the splinters out of you at once. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Amen. How I many you know the, the splinter of death that comes out of your, the, the, that's been placed in the, in the dead man's dead spirit comes out when you get born again? But there are splinters in our thinking and in, even in our hearts and our emotions that come out through time. If we let him. See, a part of being fathered by the Lord is receiving correction. And so, I mean, you know, if you're going to father correctly, if you're going to father well, there will be correction. Why? Because love says you're, you're going the wrong way. I love you. Don't, I don't want you to go that way. You follow me? And so, as, as believers, we're going to have times when the Lord is going to take truth and correct us because he loves us, because he wants to deliver us, because he's got us, he's got some place he's taking us. And we've asked him for stuff. And we believe in him for stuff. And he he he's trying to to uh <clears throat> bring in truth and, and deliver us. Amen. But when you have an area of disappointment or you have an area of pain, a lot of times we uh we don't want him to touch us with that. We don't want to bring that truth. And so you ever see an injured animal? You know, I mean, oh, they, they, they hide. They hide it and they're, they're ready to fight. And there's, a, and there's a place when truth comes to you when it's going to make you mad. Hallelujah. Is this a grace church? Hallelujah. How I many know that, that tr there's a place where, I mean, oh, Jesus periodically said stuff that made everybody mad. You know, like, Lord, we really need you to be a little bit more politically correct. If we're going to increase the number of followers that you have, <clears throat> you're going to have to not talk about feeding people your flesh and drinking your blood. <laughs> We've talked with the PR people, and they feel like that is a bad move uh, for, your, for your image and for your ministry. And we're really going to have to ask you to tone that down a little bit because people may get offended and they may not understand what you're saying. How many of you know Jesus did not give a rip on whether people really understood him at times? Because there were some times when Jesus was saying some stuff and everybody was like, we don't know what the Lord's talking about. <laughs> How many of you know we, we really had no idea until the Holy Ghost came? And, he did, and it finally, it's like he got to a place with his disciples when he was like, you know what, just wait till Pentecost. <laughs> it's cool, it's cool. No, 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 just wait till Pentecost. Let me take this ear and put it back on this guy's head and... Just wait till Pentecost, you know, the Holy Ghost is coming and phew, praise God. Amen. Because you see an element of the disciples where they kind of had no idea what he was doing. They just knew he had all kinds of power and had all kinds of love, but they really had no idea, you know? And so because he is truth, he doesn't change. But just like when I run into that wall, it changes me. <clears throat> How many you know that he a relationship with Jesus that's alive will require change. And we don't want that a lot of times. How I many know that's, and I'm not trying to, to, to kick on any denomination or non-denomination or whatever, but how I many know they're, the reasons that the revival's cool and people slip into denominationalism is because they find a the truth and camp out. And, and make a decision that 
we're cool. We don't want any more truth. We're cool with this. And you can do that. But once again, when you have a relationship with the all-powerful being of truth, if you're going to walk with him, you will be changed. And there are people who will walk down the Emmaus Road with the Lord only so far, as far as they feel comfortable, and then they'll let him continue. And I mean, oh, he, he still loves them. They're still his. But there's an element, there's an aspect of him that they're not enjoying, that they could be. But once again, it comes back to that place of disappointment and even pain uh, that we have experienced that we don't want him to touch. Amen. But he loves you so much that he wants to touch that area. Amen. And, and so, and like I said, like when the truth comes, sometimes like get mad, you know? And, and when you, when you get, when you get mad at something that's truth that's spoken or said or preached or whatever, take a look at why you're mad. Look inside yourself and say, what is it about me that, that is offended by this? Now, you must remain noble as the Bereans, and you must weigh everything steady with Scripture. Can I get an amen? Um, if it's not in the book, I don't want it. Amen? And so this is our guidelines. But if, some, if it's in the book, and it's said, and I'm offended by it, I've got the problem. Scripture doesn't have the problem. Amen. And so, but like, if I want to go where he's told me that I'm going to go, I'm going to have to allow the truth to change me. And I know I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but God's doing something. And he's just kind of like, you know. um, So... Now, and, and the beauty of it is, is like, how I many know oh, you got your own Bible? So if it's in there, you can look at it on your own and see it. Amen. And uh, amen. So, and so for like, for some, for example, some people, I mean, some people get offended at the concept of healing. I have some, I have some friends that we're on the same page in, in, in a lot of areas, but when it comes to like healing, they have shut me down, man. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to, why? Because it's not been their experience. They've experienced something different than that. And so they are not willing to even allow that to be on the table. And you know what? That's cool. You know, like that's, that's a place where, see, it's never your job to force a splinter out of somebody's life. That's, that's so important right there. Because you may be trying to operate on somebody before they got the Holy Ghost Novocaine. And you're like, man, I see that splinter on you. I'm going to pull that thing out. You need to sit down and listen to me. I got some revelation you need to hear. You know what I'm saying? Anybody ever had somebody corner you and do you like that? Were you successful? No, you weren't. You started to fight. And they fought you like a wounded animal. And you fought them like someone who had something to prove. Because what was at stake wasn't their deliverance, but your perspective. And ultimately, your pride. I know. Praise God. (laughs) Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, It does, doesn't it? It does. I I kind of felt that when I was old. (laughs) It does. It does. Amen. Amen. Self-righteousness, see, here's the thing. You never get completely delivered from the influence of self-righteousness. Jeremiah, what are you talking about? The enemy is always trying to introduce leaven back into you. If there's one thing that frustrates grace, don't you think that's the one thing the enemy is going to try to develop in your life? Pride. Self-righteousness is pride. And so... I feel like you have to guard against pride even more than temptation, even more than anything else, because it's the one thing that will frustrate grace, and it's the one thing that will put you in your own strength, and it's the one thing, listen to me, that will make you fall. And and so 
the enemy's always trying to develop self-righteousness in the church. And that's one of the reasons that Love Lady this morning was so beautiful, because there was no pride in the room. Nothing. There, was, there, were, there were humbled, surrendered, broken people in love with Jesus. And I walked in and, was, and, and entered into the atmosphere of heaven. And we didn't have, like, awesome praise and worship. We didn't have a team. We didn't have music. We had a CD. And we had speakers. And we had people completely surrendered. And I was just like, and, I, and I'm still reverberating from that experience. Because in the absence of pride will be the manifest presence of the Lord. Truth. And when pride is present, grace will be frustrated and the Lord's face will be hidden behind a veil of condemnation and even Christian arrogance. And see, we all, we all want to be confident. We all know that's important as a part of our faith, but we never want our confidence to arise out of our own willpower um, or our own strength. How many know when there's, and I say this a lot, but how many know when there's a godly confidence, everybody's edified? When there's a worldly prideful confidence, it brings other people low. Because what it's saying is, I'm awesome. And you, you, you track me here? And so the enemy is always trying to develop that self-righteous, the leaven of the Pharisees. We've got to guard against it. We cannot allow it to happen. And so, and going back to, you cannot force a splinter out of somebody. You can't do it. Because you're not the Holy Ghost. Amen? Um, now, you can declare truth and allow the Spirit of God to work, because that's how it works, but you can't force a splinter out. And so, because, because really, really, our job is to stay teachable, meek, and humble, and correctable. You know what I'm saying? And, Really, righteousness and grace helps us to do that. What are you talking about right now? Because, like, if my identity is not on the table, then I can handle correction. But, like, when, see, in this, my childhood, my mother used to have a real, she was, an, she was an alcoholic, and she would get really drunk, and she would rip me to pieces verbally for hours and not even remember it. And so, um, and, I mean, and, and so, and I was a really bad, I was a really rebellious kid, but she just get me aside and just, she ripped me, man, for hours. And she just expressing what she went through in her childhood, you know? But it brought me to a place to where I, you could, I did not want correct, anybody to correct me. Because any correction come to me, I felt like my identity was attacked. And because I was so beat down that, um, you know, that any form of correction, and I'm ready, to, I'm ready to brawl. And I carried that over into my Christianity. I mean, that's not a great quality. I mean, that's a recipe to be a fool. I mean, it really is, because, like, the defining mark of a fool is he can't be corrected. Defining mark of a wise man is he wants to be corrected. And so a part of the reason that God gets righteousness and grace to us is so that we can become sons and daughters and be corrected without feeling as though our identity is being attacked or destroyed. Y'all tracking me here? That way we can grow up and we can be mature and we can walk with the Lord. Amen? And um, you, have to, you have to kind of develop a taste for wisdom. I mean, developing a taste for wisdom is developing a taste for correction. Amen. Because how many know that, that there are things in your life right now that some wisdom from the Lord would change forever? And, like, and, and we're funny because like, we're like, God, I need a miracle. God's like, nah, you need some wisdom. <laughs> Seriously. And we don't like that kind of stuff. But it's true, though. It's like this is some growing up type stuff. Because we're like, Lord, I need a miracle. I need you to miraculously do this. And God's like, you know, see, we're not called to live. Now, I'm all for the miraculous, 
And it never, God never stops being a miracle worker on your behalf. Can I get an amen? But wisdom's the principal thing. And man, there's some, there's some problems that need wisdom, not a miracle. Because if wisdom is not delivered with the miracle, then you'll live from miracle to miracle to miracle to miracle, same situation, getting a flat tire in the same area of your life over and over and over and over and over again. Amen. And like I can remember a time where I was, uh, I was, doing, I was doing this P90X workout, and I may have shared this before, doing this P90X workout, and it was real vigorous and stuff, and I started getting these horrible headaches when I was working out, like these awful headaches like ear-splitting headaches. And I was like, man, the devil's attacking me, man. <laughs> Bless God, rebuking the devil, believing God for healing. And God was like, quit drinking so much coffee. Get thee behind me, devil. What coffee, devil. I'll drink all the coffee I want to. I'm the righteousness of God. I'm under grace. Still getting headaches. Quit drinking so much coffee. Get thee behind me, devil. <laughs> and how many of the Lord was trying to help me out and give me some wisdom for deliverance. And I was trying to resist correction and claim my righteousness and sonship in the name of rebellion. Wow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because, like, he's your dad. And he's like, Come here, son. I got something for you, you know? So you know what I did? I finally quit drinking all that coffee, and I stopped getting them headaches, you know? Praise God. And how many know there are some areas where we're wanting miracles, and God's wanting us to receive wisdom? This is especially true in finances. <laughs> it ain't nobody want to hear this. Y'all ready? Y'all ready for a splinter? Hallelujah. No amount of money will cure a foolishness problem. No amount of money will cure a foolishness problem. I mean, no, you can take money and throw it at foolishness all day long, and it's just going to burn that money right up. It is quiet up in this mug. It's quiet. Drop moment. <clears throat> because the issue, a lot of times, is there's an element of correction that needs to happen. Now, listen, and please understand if you've done all the dumb stuff and messed it all up, how many know the Lord will rescue you? Please don't think. Don't allow the enemy to condemn you right now, all right? Because you can mess everything up and make all the wrong decisions, and the Lord will rescue you. <clears throat> Can't get an amen. That's what he does. He's awesome like that. But <clears throat> he's a loving father, and he wants to give you wisdom so you don't end up back in that spot again. <clears throat> amen? Because he loves you. Like, if I didn't care about my son, then I wouldn't correct him. But because I care about him, I give him a little bit of correction and say, hey, you know, in my, my 14-year-old, he's at that place where, like, I'll give him some wisdom, and it's his choice whether he takes it or not. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can't make somebody walk in wisdom. You can invite them to. Now, I understand, like, two-year-old, you know, if he goes to put his, his uh, you know, fork in the outlet or something like that, we're going to stop him and all that type of stuff. But, like, as they get older, how I many you know they get a little bit more freedom, and there's a time when I'll tell him something, and he chooses not to do it. And then there's an element of repercussion that will teach him in a way that I can't. <sighs> you know what I'm saying? How I many know life will teach you a little bit? And I mean, if I take all repercussion away from my son, he will never become an adult. He'll remain a child forever. <sighs> Amen. And because the reality is there are consequences. And so... I mean, you know, even understanding grace and being in a grace atmosphere, grace does not remove consequences of our actions. It removes punishment from God or removed past tense. God's never going to punish you. It's, that's a done deal. 
but there are still consequences for our actions. And God, how I many know God will try to correct you? But if, but if you keep refusing the correction, how I many know there can be some consequences that'll happen? And not be, I mean, in the, once again, the consequences don't come from God, they come from the decisions. You tracking me? You know, it's like if I go home and I yell at my wife, and yell at my wife and yell at my wife. How many know Jesus loves me? How many know I'm forgiven? But how many know I'm about to get beat up? <laughs> if you know my wife, you know? There's going to be consequences for that. And, and, and preaching grace does not mean there's an absence of consequences for our actions. We can't take a concept of grace and righteousness and remove all responsibility and consequences of our behavior. I mean, that's not a message of grace. There is correction throughout Scripture. And see, truth by its very nature corrects error. You know, just as sure as the wall doesn't move, when when my error makes contact with truth, something's going to give. And it's not going to be the truth. It's going to be me. Now, I can shut myself off from the truth, and I can choose to not walk in it. And I can hold... Amen. I can nurse and baby my splinter. I can hold it and coddle it, and I can bring it to the forefront of my identity. And I can turn my pain into an idol. And I can incorrectly learn how to get attention through the display of my suffering. And because I don't know how to get attention in a positive way, I live in a state of nursing and fluffing my idol of pain because that's the only way I know how to experience love from other people. And I will not be delivered until I sit the idol down because the idol is my baby because it it's what makes me special. It's what makes people care about me. It's what gives me attention. Until I sit that idol down, till I sit, till I make the decision to sit. How do you do that? You remove it from your identity. You know, you don't you don't see yourself as a sick person. You don't see yourself as a broke person. You don't see you know you got to see as he is, so are we, right? I remove the idol by removing that from my identity. But as long as I'm going to embrace that as my identity, no amount of promises of God are going to bring deliverance because I actually like it. It's weird, isn't it? And the reason, and we've all done this, you know. Don't think I'm just singling out one person. We've all been there, but God's like, sweetie, I need you to lay that idol down. I need you to sit it down. And sometimes we we've grown accustomed to it, and we like it. We like the attention it gets us. And God's like, I want to bring deliverance into your life. I don't want you to have to carry that. But you're gonna have to sit it down, and I'm not gonna make you. That's your choice. Amen. Amen. Because God's ultimate goal for your life is freedom and happiness and joy and blessing and good things. I'm not saying there won't be turmoil and trouble because, I mean, that's just a part of this world, but, like, that's his goal. But you're only really going to enjoy that and walk in that to the degree that you allow truth to change you. So we can't grow comfortable, or we can. We, we can, but... I encourage you not to grow comfortable in the truth that you currently have. Now, and let me say this in the very same breath. There is an element of sensationalism in the body of Christ where we're always seeking after a new teaching. And if it's new, it must be true. And so we gravitate towards anything that's new and different. How many know that just because something's new doesn't mean it's true? You know what I'm saying? Like, like we like that. Like, oh man, it's exciting. It's something new. Yeah, y'all just ain't got that revelation, but I got it. And it's and it's and it's eight folds not scriptural, but the dude's saying it's so charismatic. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's new. We like it because it's new. It must be true because it's new. No, there are some things that ain't true. Period. Truth don't change. There's truth and there's not truth. And once again, we got to come back to the scripture. So. 
please understand, I'm not encouraging that sensationalism perspective in the body of Christ where we have a, 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 have a thirst for new, okay? So I'm not saying that. I mean, there are some things that don't change. But in the very same breath, um, there, there's truth, that, there's truth that, every, that we're not walking in, that God has for us. None of, no one here has arrived. Can I get an amen? That just doesn't happen in this life. No one corners the market on God. No one has all the revelation. How many know? E- Listen, if those cherubim in the throne see a new aspect of God every time they fly around it, and they're so amazed and floored that they got to cry out, "Holy of holy, 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 holy!" Like, how many think we probably going to be changed for an eternity too? And it's going to be so fun. It's going to be awesome. But so, all that being said. Truth brings change, and there's some deliverance that God wants to bring, but we have to let him do it. We have to allow him to touch that place, you know? Um, and th- and here's, here's, the even, here's an even bigger, or not bigger challenge, but this is another aspect of it, is when you've learned something out of Scripture that was taught wrong. And I've talked about this a lot here, and I talk about this a lot, but like you, you, scriptural truth was, a uh, scripture was presented to you, but it was twisted and it was wrong. And so now you're hurt and now you want to talk about that subject. Amen. And so, you know, cause like when I, when I, um, when I, when I really kind of got a hold of grace, I basically threw everything else away. Like everything. I was like, all that other stuff, I just want Jesus. Don't talk to me about the gifts of the Spirit. Don't talk to me about healing. Don't talk to me about prosperity. Don't talk to me about anything. Just give me the cross. That's all I want. And that's a pretty safe place. However, how many know that if it's in the Scripture, then it's true? And just because somebody messed it up doesn't mean it's messed up. And so there's an element of restoration of truth that we made a decision to throw away. Because we were hurt in it. And see, what we don't want is we want the church to, to build. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? Well, we don't want to lose what those that came before us labored so hard to pioneer and bring back. Because what we do a lot of times is like we'll get a fresh revelation of something and we want that. Then we let go of all this. And God said, sweetie, I don't want you to let go of that. I want you to build on it. And, 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 but we have a tendency to like, and what we want, we want, we want it all. Amen? We want everything that he paid for. And that will involve revisiting things that were twisted and abused. You know something that we don't want to lose sight of in what, what's going on right now in the Reformation and stuff that's happening? Don't lose the sight, sight of the fact that God wants to bless you financially. Don't lose that. People worked hard to establish that as reality in the body of Christ. People spent their entire lives kicking that cow down. Poured out their lives and their, and their ministries and everything in order so that the church could realize there's nothing spiritual about poverty. But it was so ingrained in the church by the devil that it was, it was such a severe stronghold that it diminished our voice to a whisper compel, compared to the world's megaphone. Because the world got all the cash. And so their voice is louder than the church's voice. Hollywood has an unlimited budget to present lies as truth. The church has a limited budget to present truth. And because their budget's bigger than our budget, it looks like what they're saying is more real than what we're saying. Why did that happen? Because we embraced the lie that poverty was spiritual. There is no place in Scripture that supports a father that does not take care of his kids. Is God your father? Are you his kid? Does he want to take care of your needs? Does he want to go past taking care of your needs and give you an abundance 
so you can take care of somebody else's needs. So simple. When we, when we pull it out of the context of what we've learned in the past, and then you got people that have abused money so much in the church that, like, you get to that place where you're like, dear God, if they'd bring up giving one more time. Like, one more, don't even say it. Like, I've had moments, I can remember one time they were doing some kind of give a somewhere. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> somewhere. And, like, we weren't going to have our programming until somebody gave some money. And my son was like, he was really little. My Ethan was really little. He's like, Dad, what are they doing? I was, like, embarrassed for the church. I was like, they're begging for money, son. And, like, hallelujah. How many know that got abused and messed up? Bad. Why? So that the greed of a few would steal the reality of giving from the church so that our voice would stay small. The enemy was the author of all of that. Amen. And it's funny because it's this, this area right here is the area that is, is potentially people get the most weird about. This and healing. But more of this. Why? Because we all got to have money to live, right? See, y'all ain't giving me no amens now. I'm still Uncle Jeremiah from Kentucky. What's up? <laughs> hey, man, do you think there might be a splinter that needs to get removed? That God wants to bless you so you can be a blessing? Hey, Amen. Poverty's a mindset. It's got to be broken. The presence of poverty is not the absence of stuff. The presence of poverty is the absence of worth. Hmm. Because being poor makes you feel unworthy. Makes you feel not as good. How you know, Jeremiah? Because I grew up broke. Food stamps, not cool clothes, barely surviving, raised by a single mom, doing the best she could. I know what poverty looks like and what it feels like and what it tastes like. And at the end of the day, it makes you feel not as important as someone who has. There's an element of shame that comes with it that's different than even uh, than, than healing and stuff like that. So that about poverty makes you feel unworthy. And how many know that it is important for to God? that his children recognize their worth. How I many know when we get to heaven, we find out what God, how God feels about money? We walk on it. Streets of gold. How I many know people are more valuable than stuff? But we live in a world that says stuff's more valuable than people. And so when the children of Israel came out of slavery, God said, I want you to take the stuff and I want you to put it on your kids. The silver, the gold, the jewels, the clothes. How many know they got all that from the Egyptians? How many of they spoiled the Egyptians? How many of that was important to God? Not because the stuff was important, but because the children understanding their worth was important. And he said, I want you to put that on your kids because I want you to break a poverty slave mindset off of their lives so they'll recognize all this stuff, it serves you. You don't serve it. How many of you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things are added to you? See, when we pursue the things for our worth and our value, we have it backwards. And then money becomes our God. Money calls the shots. Mammon is established and we become slaves even though we're free. God says, I'm bigger than money. I'm more important than money. If you'll seek me, I'll take care of everything else. Can I get an amen? amen. And so, and, and, but poverty is a mindset. I mean, old, I mean it's, it's something that has to be broken off of somebody's life. You know, I can... Um, 
you know, someone was telling me that, that took in foster kids and stuff, and they were, you know, sharing some testimonies with me. But when they first get the kids, they just, the kids just can't stop eating. And they're taking food, and they're shoving it in their pockets, and, they're, and they're, they can't stop eating. Why? Because they've not known what it's like to be able to eat when you want to. And so because they only understand surviving, when they first come, they're bringing a surviving scarcity poverty mentality. And how many of it takes time to remove that off of them? But eventually what happens to them kids is they, they, when they recognize there's more than enough food for everybody, you're going to be taken care of, slowly the food loses importance and preeminence because they know it's going to be there as a result of being loved. It doesn't become the focus. And so money shouldn't be the focus. Things shouldn't be the focus. The Lord should be the focus. He should be first. But please understand, your father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And it is very selfish and small-minded to want to have just enough for yourself. And we have, we have, we have, we have spoken that mantra as a form of uh, spirituality, and it's a big load of crap. <laughs> because you, you, you're never called to survive in the kingdom. You're called to thrive. Can I get an Amen. And you're called for it to flow to you and to flow through you. And see, this concept of, I, I'm going to let it flow through me when I win the lottery. That is not how it works. It's got to flow through you now. Because, how I many know that when, when you let the water out and it starts to flow, that it attracts more water to flow and more water to flow? You follow me? And so it's not an issue of what it is. The key is that fear is not the dominating force in your heart, but love is, okay? And you're not a survivor, you're a thriver. And as you are faithful over a little, how many know God's going to bring more into your life? Can I get an amen? So important. If I want to get cookies to you, if I'm standing up here and I have a bag of cookies and I'm going to get cookies to you, I'm going to give those cookies, and I can't give them to you directly. I'm going to give those cookies to someone I know that will pass them on. If there's someone that's, that, that, that is going to eat all the cookies that are given to them, I can't give them an abundance of cookies because they're just going to eat the cookies, and they're not going to let the cookies flow through them. How many know God looks for people that will let the cookies flow through them? How many know God has given you seed? And if you eat all your seed, you don't have a harvest. Amen. And God wants to get it to you and through you. But if I'm looking and I'm trying to get blessing to somebody, and I'm up here, and I need it to get all the way back here, I'm going to find the channels that will work with me. I'm going to trust the one that I can get it to. Can I get an amen? And see, that doesn't start with much. That starts with little. And what I'm looking for, I'm looking for as the Lord, you know, as, as, I've got someone in the back I need to bless. I see him back there, and I want to bless him. And I know all the people who they're connected with. And so I'm not going to give everything to the eater. I'm going to give it to the giver. Now, I'm still going to give to the eater because I love the eater too. How I many you know God take, takes care of the birds, and they don't sow or reap? They just eat, but he still takes care of them. But if I want to get the person in the back, I can't give to the eater. I got to give to the giver. I got to give to the person that trusts that I'm going to give more to them so I can get it to them and I can flow through them. Now, these are things we've learned or some of us have learned in the past. These are all biblical principles and truth that we let go because someone greedily, corruptedly abused this. Amen. Like, we just come out of some really nasty stuff in regards to this. People are trying to sell healing and anointing and giftings and, 
I mean, if, you, if you've ever heard me preach, I usually hit it at least four or five times during the sermon about that because I hate it so much. But how I many know we can't allow the enemy to rob us of this reality because it's still a reality. God wants to bless his people with an abundance. Why? Because if you have an abundance, you're going to have a greater level of influence and you're going to have people that you can bless. Amen. The first thing at the top of the list of the blessing of Abraham is wealth. I mean, he was rich in silver and gold. I can't even believe I'm preaching on this tonight, but I'm not in control. Spirit of prophet, subject to the prophet, but I'm not leading, I'm following. God wants to bless you, church. And um, you might have a splinter in this area that, you, that he's inviting you to let him touch it so he can pull it out. Amen. Why? Because he wants to bless you. Amen. He wants to bless you. He wants to help you. He wants to love you and supply for you. Amen. And then it's going to bless you. It's going to bless people around you. But you know what it's also going to do? It's going to amplify the voice. What if the church of Jesus Christ had the budget that Hollywood has? How quick would we evangelize the world? You know what I'm saying? How quick? Like it took somebody in Hollywood to make a decent enough movie where we could see the passion of the Christ. You know, I mean, that movie wasn't really produced by the church. Amen. Because if, and I hate to say this about us, but if we'd have done it, it probably would have been bad. (laughs) You know, I hate to say that about us, but, you know, it would have been cheap. It would have been bad. I mean, oh, God help us. But God's like, all right. And so, amen. But how many of that movie was done really well? And and as a result, it had tremendous impact. How many of that's a truth that's been a reality for 2,000 years? But nobody had the money or the guts to put it out visually. And so God touched a fairly unsanctified brother, no diss on Mel Gibson. I'm really thankful for him. You know, praise God. I mean, seriously, I'm thankful for him. But, you know, anyway, all right, sorry. But, like, and so so that we could get this truth amplified to the point where it became visual and it changed people's lives in a very dramatic way. Did that movie affect y'all? It overwhelmed me. Like, it totally, now, because I got to see what happened. I mean, not exactly, but. You know why you saw it? Because there was money involved. Without the finances to produce it, it wouldn't have happened. Amen. How many of you guys got ideas that God's given you that will change the world? I really appreciate those hands. I really do, because like, cause, cause if you lifted your hand up without me asking you to, that means it's burning on the inside, of you and you're like, yeah, right here. Well, how many think that God wants to bless you so that that can come to pass? Let go of the splinter. Or what if God wants to bless somebody else in here so that he can bless you to bring it to pass? You, you're tracking me? I mean, there there are people who are called to be paymasters in the body of Christ. There are people who are called to the gift of giving. I know people like that. And when they really have that gift, it's not for show. Left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. But we, as a church, man, we've got to we've got to let God restore these truths to us so that we can enjoy what Jesus paid for. And so we can help him be a blessing to other people. And don't allow the enemy to steal that truth from us. And not just in that area, but any area. Amen. And so in the days ahead, truth is coming. And it will ask you to change. And it will be your choice. And it's pretty much always going to be like that. In the days ahead, in the days after that, truth will be coming. And it will ask you to change. It's not even asking you to change. It's just saying, I'm the truth. (laughs) You know, 
And so, but because you have, to, you have pretty much, you have a couple options there. You can embrace it and let it change you and bring forth the goodness that it has for you, or you can camp out where you're at, usually, or you can get offended. And getting offended is the, is the worst scenario of the three. Because how many know, how many know offense is a trap? There is no single place in Scripture where God encourages you to be offended. Like, there's, no, there's never a time where being offended is spiritual or even right. Please understand that. And, often, and it's, the pri- it's one of the primary attacks of the enemy. What does offense seek to do? It seeks to separate you from your fellow believers. Because you get offended, and then you remove. And then when you're behind that offense, you're looking through the bars, and you don't see clearly. And then what people say gets twisted in your, perspe- your perception. And then you, because how many know when you get offended, it's hard, hard it's, it can be difficult to deliver someone's an offense. Because everything you say, they're offended. Even when you're trying to help them out, it sounds like you're not. Because the because their perception is skewed and they, they, they're actually, they, they've decided to take offense. And so many times what happens is there's nothing you can do for that person. Amen. And you have to just trust that the Lord will help them and will deliver them. Because it's almost like the harder you try to destroy, try to restore them, the harder they get offended. Very painful thing as a, to see as a leader. Uh, because you love people. But, but I just tell you, there's an enemy, and he's going to try to get you offended at the truth. Amen. To try to separate you from the body. How many of you know if you, if you cut the circulation off a finger or an arm, how many of you know eventually there's a death? Right? And the enemy is always trying to separate you from the body of Christ and get offended. Because, and here's the thing, everything, and this is what we have to understand, I mean, there's no perfect church. You know why it's not perfect? Because we're here. Because we're here, amen? And so there comes a time when we have to love each other through some rough spots, especially when we're under construction, especially when truth is coming to bring change. In that season, cover each other in love. Even though you may not understand everything, even though you may not agree with everything, cover each other in love. Don't allow offense to lead you. How I many you know offense leading you is not the Spirit of God leading you? Don't give it that much power. Amen? It's a trap. Be led by the Spirit of God. Amen? Cover each other in love. Let truth change you so that God can take you where he's wanting to take you, individually and corporately as a church, because great days are ahead. This is a flagship. You guys are, uh, you guys are going some places that uh, other people are going to follow you into. And so... You're going first, and people are watching you. And so what you're doing is not just for you. It's for the people that will come after you. And that's why it's important to obey God and not man. Because if you were going to obey man and nothing but man, you'd be a politician, not a pastor. I mean, politicians, uh, and I'm not trying to diss politicians. They're good politicians, too, but... But, uh, I mean, you know, being a leader is not being a politician, especially in the things of the kingdom. And I don't just mean that from, you know, just the leadership of this church. I mean, everybody in here is a leader. You got a choice. I mean, you can follow people's opinion or you can follow what God's telling you to do. And how I many you know at the end of the day, you got to follow what God's telling you to do because that's the only thing that really matters. Amen? Because how I many you know you're not trying to get votes? You just need one vote. Actually, three. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. Amen. Cool. Amen. <laughs> I'm 
just trying to see if there's anything else. I don't think there is. I think we're done. Just want to make sure. Amen. So, and so the cool thing is, is like there's some really awesome stuff that's going to happen. That's that's like at the end of the day, that's like the best part. And it's it's going to happen corporately, and it's going to happen individually. It's going to be amazing. But as it but as it but but understand though, there's some places that God wants to take you where there's there's some truth that's going to have to remove some splinters. Amen. Will you let Him do it? Do you trust Him? Do you love Him? Because He loves you, right? Amen. And then the key is just wait with Scripture. Just wait with Scripture. That's all you got to do. I'm going to pray.